And that's another thing that's super important. And I see a lot of times get mistaken, which is never forget how the business grows, right? So, you know, you cannot be an armchair or a desk chair um, entrepreneur for a natural foods business. You've got to be connected to what's happening in the trade. And so it's funny, we, we, um, I'm literally in a store every day. Now, sometimes it just means there's, there's a giant supermarket across the street from our office. So maybe it's just too easy, but <laughs> I'm, I always walk through the store and I'll always spot something that I either learn or a little insight or just sort of understand a transformation that's happening. Um, and so you just, you got to stay connected to what's happening and, and, you know, you can look at your numbers, all our spreadsheets all day, but that's, that's one way to look at the business. Um, but if you lose sight of what really drives a business, that's, that's a bad, bad sign. This is Evolve CPG, a community of purpose-driven brand leaders who not only believe in better, but actively pursue it. That's better products, better brands, and better leadership for a better world. Thanks to you, our listeners, this podcast is now ranked in the top 10% of all podcasts globally. Let's not stop there, though. If you like our show, please take a moment to leave us a rating or review and share your favorite episodes with your network. The more people we reach, the more good we can bring about in this world. If you work in the industry, you can also join our online community where we're going further, faster, together at community.evolvecpg.com. I'm your host, Gage Mitchell founder and creative director of Modern Species, a sustainable brand design agency helping better brands grow and scale their impact. On this episode, we're speaking with Seth Goldman, co-founder and CEO of Eat the Change, about his original mission when founding Honest Tea, how he quickly launched Just Ice Tea to replace Honest soon after Coca-Cola announced discontinuing that brand, what he's up to now with Eat the Change, and his advice for fellow mission-driven brand leaders. Hi, I'm Seth Goldman. I'm the co-founder of Eat the Change. We sell planet-friendly food and snacks. Uh, We have a land of mushroom jerky, carrot snacks, and our latest product, Just Iced Tea. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Seth. I'm super excited to talk about what you're currently working on. Uh, But before we get there, I'd like to kind of trace the journey from where you started to where you are now. Looking at your background in business, it seems like you've pretty much always been purpose-driven. Where did that drive come from? Yeah, um, well, thank you. And it's nice to be here. And, and I've always enjoyed your comments and insights on LinkedIn. So it's, it's nice to be able to speak to you live. Uh, <laughs> For sure. I was raised in, um, grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts. My parents were both professors. So um, even though one was an economist, one was a historian, um, and so I wasn't really steeped in business, but I was definitely raised with the expectation that you know, understand that what you do matters and, and work should have a purpose and life should have a purpose. And so uh, and, and just <laughs> making money isn't a purpose. <laughs> True that. I wish more people understood that because right? it's like so many people get caught up in the make money as a goal or scale as a goal without yeah. a reason for um, being beyond that. and. I don't know. That, that for me is frustrating, but I'm glad that you were instilled with that kind of ethos from day one. Um, so you launched Honest Tea uh, back in 98. Obviously, the world's pretty different here in 2022. So what did the food and beverage industry look like back then, if you can give us yeah. a little snapshot? And why did you choose that category? It'll be hard for people um, who weren't growing up then to, to appreciate this, but back in 1998, the average calorie profile of a bottled iced tea was about 200 calories per bottle, so 100 calories per eight ounce serving. And the first ingredient was high fructose corn syrup. And that, whether it was Snapple or Arizona, that was just the way that category looked like. And, and by the way, they weren't, it wasn't just iced tea, it was basically all drinks had that super sweet taste profile. And uh, there really weren't organic bottled drinks, and there certainly weren't fair trade certified bottled drinks either. And so um, people were given lots of different choices in terms of flavor, but not really much choice around uh, sweetness, taste profile, or or sourcing. And uh, I was one, you know, I lived in that world. So it wasn't like I, you know, um, (laughs) I I participated as a consumer of those drinks, but I always wish there was something less sweet. And it kind of, that idea kind of crystallized when I was at the Yale School of Management. 
and my professor Barry Nailbuff was teaching a case study on the beverage industry. And then, you know, out of that discussion emerged the idea there should be something less sweet. And if no one else is going to do that, perhaps we should be the ones doing it. Interesting. What was that uh, presentation or discussion? Was it that just that nobody was doing it or that nobody no, was doing it and there was a strong about, desire for it? Yeah, it was called the Cola War. So it was really more about how Pepsi and Coke were competing. And, and basically uh, all they were doing was just trying different marketing tactics to sell more brown fizzy liquid. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, Barry said, well, is there any other way they should be competing? Because one would do some a Pepsi challenge, another one would sign up some other celebrity. And that was the way they were competing. And, and so rather than just knock heads and for, you know, trying to eke out a little bit more market share, let's shift the whole play, you know, not just, you know, make it a three dimensional game and look at other categories and other sweetness taste profiles and other sourcing. Uh, and even though, you know, Coke and Pepsi didn't get involved in that, at least initially. Uh, if you wanted, if we wanted to compete in the beverage world, this would be a way to offer something that other folks didn't, that wasn't on the market. And that, you know, yeah, that sort of led to, at the that. time, so it was in business school. So Barry, Barry was so excited about the idea. He said, oh, let's do some samples and focus groups. And I, this was in my second year of business school. I got to go find a job. So <laughs> I'm not going to do anything about it at this time. But, but, you know, sure enough, a few years after business school, uh, when I, had come back across this idea. Then I reached out to Barry and said, I think I am ready to do something about this. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that It sounds like they were mostly focused on better marketing rather than a better product, right. right? So maybe they yeah. were just so caught up in competing against each other for yeah. the most clever campaign that they forgot to think about product. And then fast forward to today, though, like a lot of those, both you know, Pepsi and Coke ended up buying all these juice companies and tea companies and all this other kind of stuff to eventually catch up. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then, you know, they obviously have floundered as well. So they, mm -hmm. they realized there was an opportunity to be in the better for you space and the, you know, better sourcing space, but I don't think they um, completed the play. Right. So they, they bought honest right. tea, they bought other brands, uh, but they haven't, uh, and Pepsi as well, you know, had a whole portfolio of, fresh natural drinks and, and for the most part have um, divested themselves of those as well. So um, yeah. I, what the, I guess the, the, the bottom line is there's still opportunities for entrepreneurs who can make healthier drinks available and success, you know, um, can, can expand the market. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't remember how long you were running on ST independent before you sold to Coca-Cola, but what were your hopes and dreams when, when that opportunity came to you? Well, even before we sold, you know, the, the vision for Honesty, and by the way, the Honesty business plan is still available on the internet. Uh, it's at the, oh. right now it's at the honesty.com uh, website. Um, and the vision was always to democratize uh, healthier drinks, to make them available to people everywhere, not just to the healthy and wealthy, not just to the coasts or the natural food stores. And so a lot of that, transpired through our transaction with Coca-Cola. We expanded from being in 15,000 stores to 150,000 stores. And we got to, uh, and, and are still, you'll see Honest Kids, our organic drink line carried in places like Wendy's and Subway and McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. So we definitely did expand uh, in, uh, the availability of organic drinks. So oh, that makes sense. Yes, in a way, those, those dreams were realized. Uh, and even, you know, what we did with Honest Tea was, was um, impactful. I mean, obviously, it's, it's sad, even tragic that Coke um, dis is discontinuing Honest Tea. But the fact is yeah. that the market, we, and I, when I say we, I mean my team and then Coca-Cola, the market we created for Honest Tea still exists. And so while from Coke's perspective, they're exiting, <laughs> from my perspective, it's an amazing business opportunity to launch Just Iced Tea. And that's, that's what we've been doing. And We've seen a huge response, so it's kind of a gift. As much as I wish Coke wasn't discontinuing Honest Tea, it's a gift for our business to have the opportunity to go build this brand. Yeah, for, for big business, you know, they need to make tough decisions sometimes that seem silly from the outside, and I'm sure for them it like made sense in some way, like just focus on fewer products because they need to streamline or whatever, but to your point, to that's predict. still a huge business. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm willing to predict a few years from now, someone's going to say, what were we thinking when we yeah. exited this category? Because I'm confident 
that just iced tea will be larger than honest tea was within a matter of years. Yeah. I mean, it helps relaunching when you already have all your experience, you already have all your connections, you already have the yeah. knowledge, you can skip decades of learning, right? Yeah. So I imagine that will be fast growth. Yeah. No, we, we're, we're, we're having a lot of fun and, um, it is, it, it, it is nice to, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot of fear, uh, when we were building honesty just cause we had no clue and we were always sort of just on the bubble of going out of business. And, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's still risk obviously with what we're doing at eat the change, but just to, um, build this with, with partners that I've known now for more than, you know, in some cases more than two decades who know what to do, who, who um, do it so well. Uh, it's, and to bring in new people who, are fr who have fresh energy as well. It's just a, it really has been a joyful um, process. I, I, we just completed a first sales blitz in New York City this week with our distributor. So this distributor is called Big Geyser. And I initially worked with the founder of Big Geyser, and now his son is the CEO. And oh, it's cool. just, you know, it is, it is a, um, you know, for him to continue the work, the legacy his father began is a joy for him. And for me to build the partnership we had with them is, is, is wonderful. And so, um, there is, there's no, um, we're not wringing our hands and mourning the loss of honesty. We're, we're building the next great brand. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things that struck me about this whole case study or story was you were, you know, one of the original kind of mission driven companies in this space. And then you get scooped up by big food, which a lot of companies have over the years. And the idea to some degree is that great. Now we can integrate some of this mission into big food yeah. and big food can help us further our mission. Right. But then what we see here with this Coca-Cola case study is that as soon as times get tough or they need to narrow their portfolio, they, they drop a product line, not even thinking about their mission. Right. So it's kind of this idea of, can you still continue a mission-driven business even in a uh, big, big food business? So I'm curious, um, since you're so mission-driven, do you think having experienced all this now, would you sell another brand to big food? Well, there's no question it's a setback when Coke discontinues a, an organic fair trade brand because, um, you know, it, it shows they, it, it didn't successfully penetrate. I think, you know, um, I look at this as a much longer journey. And so, yes, we definitely move things forward for organic and fair trade. And, and although, of course, Honest Tea is being discontinued, as I mentioned, Honest Kids is fully embraced and expanded under with Coca-Cola. So, you know, um, this is by no means a total failure. I think the other thing that's interesting is that, um, and to me, a, a good part of this, there was no effort by Coca-Cola, and this is to their credit, no effort by them to try to take shortcuts on the brand. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't say, Oh, honesty is not working. Well, let's, let's stop making it organic or, or let's make it uh, sweeter right. or let's not do fair trade, you know? And so I, I, to me, I, it's much, what would have been the most painful experience would have right. been if they started yeah. making those kind of cuts to honesty, then I would have um, felt really sad. So instead they just said, we, we can't build this brand as it is created and we're going to just step away from it. And obviously, like I said, it's an opportunity for us. In terms of whether we would sell, I, I, I can't even contemplate that. What, what I, <laughs> and I'm certainly not building this with the des desire to sell it off. What I'm doing is trying to create something valuable. And yeah. um, you know what? I, one of my be most um, wise board members uh, told me back when we were building Odyssey in the early 2000s, he said, build a brand like you're always going to own it be and make, do, make every decision that you'll be proud of today as you would 10 years from now, or even if your children owned it. And, and if you create value, good opportunities will come. And it may mean, you know, ex, um, somehow expanding it, You know, you do have an obligation to get, to give your investors their money back. So I recognize that. Um, and I don't take that obligation lightly, but I'm certainly not, you know, looking to spin. This is not a flip company. I'm looking to flip, you know, we're looking to build long-term value here. Yeah. And that is, Sadly, of what a lot of people, I think, in the CPG space come into thinking is, I'm going to come in, build a brand, grow it across five or 10 years, and then exit. And that, that is their game plan, right? But yeah. to your point, especially if it's a mission-driven business, if you run it as though that's not the game plan, that maybe 
any selling or acquisition or investment is just to further the mission, but not to exit, then you're probably going to build a brand with more integrity. Yeah. 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 I think it is the right way to think about it. And, um, you know, um, one, one thing I would say, rather than say my plan to sell it, if I look back at what happened with honesty, what was a mistake? I I still stand by the decision to partner with Coca-Cola based on what I knew at the time. Um, yeah. But okay. we were probably too small. Um, so if we were over a hundred million in sales, um, I'd like to think that we got we we would be at a place where they couldn't just sort of step away from it, and and they and and they wouldn't be able to compromise it. I think at um, by the we and when I left, we were at about two hundred million in sales as a brand, but most of that was honest kids, not honest tea. So okay. um, I won't even sort of contemplate other ways, other steps for this business um, until we're at least over a hundred million in sales and, and built something that's unstoppable. Okay. Yeah. That, that's an interesting perspective. And I did like what you talked about too, about how, you know, they didn't necessarily while owning the brand, try to cut corners. Cause I, I hear yeah. what you're saying there. Like not only is it hard to be this tiny brand in a big business, but then to hand off your business to a big brand and watch them, kind of erode what you originally Ugh. created has to be and I've seen that more happen. heartbreaking than see it go away. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw that with like Adwala because, you know, since I was inside the building at right. Coca-Cola, yeah. I sat in on some Adwala meetings and, and they were just painful to see how they would chip away at what the brand really, what its origins, what its spirit was. And, you know, like I say, I'm proud that or thankful that never happened with honesty. Yeah, it is great. Yeah. So that's a good perspective. And, you know, I was thinking of it as, Maybe you can't maintain mission within big food to some degree, but to your point, the mission was maintained, but at a certain yep. point, they just couldn't justify continuing it. And that's okay because like you said, it created space for you or other entrepreneurs to come in and fill that gap. And yep. that's fine if big, big food needs to like justify their product line just based on their own uh, business yeah. needs at the moment. And, and let's not, you know, like I say, let's not overlook the continuing impact of honest kids. So honest kids, which is, yeah. you know, yeah. well over you know, several hundred million brand, dollar brand, you know, just putting honest kids alone. Uh, we launched that at McDonald's, uh, as I said, it's a permanent menu item. And so they're selling over, um, you know, 200 million units of honest kids in McDonald's. And that, that drink, which is a 35 calorie juice box, um, had or juice drink box, you know, uh, replace a product that was at 80 calories. And so there alone, just selling on his kids, McDonald's has removed over a billion calories from the American diet. So that's a real impact for both Coca-Cola and McDonald's that they should be proud of. And, and of course, when you expand it even more, there's real impact happening. So it, yeah. there are, there are encouraging things happening, um, despite you know, yeah. setbacks. Yeah, that makes sense. Out of curiosity, did you launch Honest Kids before the acquisition or, or yes, was that yes, developed? Yes, we, we launched that okay. in about 2006 and then Coke invested in 2008 and they bought the company in 2011. And, okay. and by the way, another good example. So with Honest Kids, when we, when Coke, when we launched Honest Kids, we initially sweetened it with, with cane sugar, organic cane sugar. But when we started working with Coca-Cola and we looked at their supply chain, we realized we could take sugar cane out and sweeten it only with organic uh, fruit juice concentrate. Oh. Now, technically, or you know, the optics on the label are the same. The calories are the calories, but from a, when you look at the ingredient panel to only have fruit juice in there and no sugar, no cane sugar added. That's you know, once again, that's a positive step, and that happened because of Coke's capabilities. Yeah, that's a great story too. Yeah. So speaking of honest kids, though, honest kids is continuing. So as you've started launching Just Iced Tea to replace Honest Tea, do you foresee a Just Iced Tea for Kids line? <laughs> well, no. I, I Look, you know, I, I, we wouldn't have launched Just Iced Tea if, if Honest Tea uh, were still around. And right. Honest Kids yep. is still around. So I, I have no desire to go compete against a product that's already in the market. What we have done that I am excited about is we've launched our own Cosmic Carrot Chews at Eat the Change. So these uh. are... Um, what I had always thought was it would be great to have a snack that could go in a kid's lunchbox that's analogous to Honest Kids. So Honest Kids, a healthier, lower calorie drink that parents like and, and kids like, what would be the snack version of that? And what we did was we found a way to make carrots delicious and fun 
and yet still be carrots. You know, so our our cosmic carrot shoes are um, carrot snacks for kids that are made with whole carrots. There's a, a full serving of carrots in every pouch. They have all the vitamin A and nutritional pr- and fiber of a carrot, but it's in a way that's chewy and fun for a kid. Yeah. So was that the original I- idea when launching the carrot shoes? Was exactly that you just wanted to get back yeah. into the kids space and have something healthy yeah. for kids? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So. With Eat the Change, so your your current business model, you've wrapped, you have the carrot chews, you have mushroom jerky, and now you're kind of wrapping the just iced tea under that. So can you talk a little bit about what you envision for this phase of business with, with Eat sure. the Change, and then you've got different product lines and different yeah. brands under that? Yeah, so what Eat the Change really is, is it's a brand that um, embraces the notion that what we eat matters. What we eat is our single biggest footprint on the planet environmentally. And so let's make sure people have choices that are um, as planet friendly as possible. And by that, I mean organic certified, all plant based, um, low water footprint. uh, And and then let's also support biodiversity. And so we exclude in our recipes uh, the six most common crops, meaning no corn, soy, wheat, potatoes, rice or Uh. sugar cane. Uh, And so uh, certainly mushrooms was the first product line we brought out. Mushrooms are very uh, environmentally efficient. They can grow on waste. They only require 40 gallons of water to make a pound of mushrooms. In contrast, uh, almonds require 1,900 gallons of water to make a pound of almonds, so dramatically different. Uh, and yeah. they're nutrient-dense, of course. And then our next product line, the carrots. Carrots only require 20 gallons of water to make uh, a pound of carrots, so also in nutrient-dense and, and environmentally efficient. And then tea leaves. Tea is, there's no irrigation that happens with tea leaves. They grow in mountainous regions uh, and can you know super light to move around. Uh, and so for us, we, we didn't set out with uh, bottled tea in our plan, but when Coke uh, shared the news about discontinuing on his tea, we realized uh, we could do this very quickly and, and it fit within our, the, our charter. So do you plan with Eat the Change to launch, continue having kind of sub-brands within Eat the Change? Because I think if, I know, if I'm no, understanding correctly, no. the carrots and mushrooms are under the brand Eat the Change, right? But now Just yeah. Iced Tea is it's a different brand. Yeah, well, it didn't make sense to put a bottle tea under the name "Eat the Change" because it's a drink. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, drink the we change. are going to be. <laughs> we are make, we are taking step. We have trademarked that, by the way. Uh, but we are taking steps <laughs> to. We are taking steps to integrate the two. So you'll start seeing the logo behind me. That'll start appearing on the caps of Just Iced Tea, to help people understand that they're all one family of products. Okay, so I like the you were kind of focusing on the ingredients or, you know, crops or whatever that are healthy, nutrient dense and, and better for the environment. So there, are there any other current crops that you have in your mind right now that you'd love to create a product line around? Oh yeah. No, there's a lot. I mean, so right now we've got to sell what we made. We, we've, 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 <laughs> you know, my co-founder chef Spike Mendelson is an amazing innovator and chef. And so he's in the kitchen working on all kinds of amazing things, but we've got to sell the mushrooms, sell the carrots and sell the tea. That's, you know, this, this three product lines, well, technically four, because we now have adult carrots. So four product lines is a lot of product lines for a company that's only a few years old and um, just growing. So we got to sell those first, but we've got a whole list of other directions we can go Yeah. once those sell. Yeah, the three product lines, but not only that, but you're kind of in three different categories too, like three different spaces yeah. in the retail store. So what are the, yep. how are you overcoming that challenge of not being able to like have a bunch of stuff in snacks, for example, but you got like drinks, yeah. snacks, turkey, kids, kids food, adult food. <laughs> kind of... Yeah. In general though, it is the same buyer. So we'll go to a sales meeting with, you know, even if it's whole foods or sprouts and uh, we'll be able to talk about a whole product line to them. We don't just have to say, I got to go meet with a drink buyer and I'm going to go meet with the, you know, snack buyer uh, in a, in a large chain, like a Wegmans or a giant, they'll say, well, we're the natural foods buyer and we can deal with it there. So, and then, of course, the goal is to be able to promote together. You know, uh, you'd love to see an end cap on the end of an aisle in a grocery store that has the drinks and the snacks, right? Sort of cross merchandising. Um, and certainly we'll be doing, uh, making our efforts on marketing to do that. As we talk about uh, every year, we have a whole campaign during Earth Month, the Incredible Planet Challenge, where we encourage people to make planet friendly choices. And obviously, we'll be able to, to emphasize drinks and snacks at the same time. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. 
hadn't thought about the the efficiencies of selling into the store, but then eventually you can also have efficient efficiencies in selling to the yeah. consumers, but with through in caps and other things like that yeah. too. And one of the things I'm so lucky with here is that the sale. So we have 16 employees at Eat the Change. Nine of them worked with me at Honest Tea, and so I've got a team of folks who know how to bring these products to market, and they have relationships, you know, uh, all through the supply chain as well. So. They they have um, they're able to use leverage those relationships to sell in and and maybe the buyer they worked with you know five years ago maybe they were, that was a, a beverage person five years ago now maybe it's a snack person so these you know um, these relationships help too yeah so I think there was a little bit of a gap between when you kind of left Coca Cola and started Eat the Change and you were kind of just being an advisor I think sitting on boards for other brands and stuff so. Why, why not just kind of continue down that path of advising and sitting on boards and investing? Why, why did you decide yeah. to get into the, uh, the dirty work yeah. and the difficult work again of being an entrepreneur again? So it wasn't too much of a gap. So what happened was in 2015, I started to split my time. Half my time with Beyond Meat uh, and half my time with Honesty. And I did that through 2019. Um, at the end of, or at the beginning of 2020, I, I stopped my work with Honesty. And I shifted from being executive chair of Beyond Meat to becoming chair of the board, in which I still okay. hold that role. And so then basically from, uh, you know, we launched Eat the Change in July of 2020. So there really wasn't that much of a transitional period. I also got involved with Plant Burger, the, uh, a startup restaurant chain, and uh, which I'm still a, a co-founder of. Um, but for me, uh, and I... I, I like I say, I continue to, to enjoy my role as chair of the board of Beyond Meat, but I love being in the arena. I love, you know, being the one building the business. It's, I, I'm, I'm still happy to give advice where it's appropriate and I, and, and input. And I, as I said, I'm deeply engaged with Beyond Meat, but uh, rather than sit on boards um, and be sort of a passive influencer, I want to, I would like to be the one acting. And, and I got to say, uh, partially because of the team we have is so many great people. This has just been such a, a joyful experience to bring together this amazing group of people, uh, people I really love seeing. Like I, I do get a little spring in my step every day. I walk into the office and able to just see people who are extremely competent, but also who really believe in what we're doing, um, treat each other with respect, um, people I'm proud to call friends and to have the opportunity to work with them every day is it's a gift. So um, I, I don't think I would have that same sense of um, joy if I were just advising versus really acting and making it happen. And then, you know, obviously I believe in what we're doing. I think the work here is important. I think uh, America's diet is, needs, is in desperate need of, of addressing. Our planet is mm, in serious right. need. And I don't want to be a, um, a passenger on our planet. I want to be an actor. I want to be able to hopefully make an impact or at least talk of, you know, show my both children. And if they, I have someday have grandchildren to say, you know, um, just like I learned from my parents, you're not a passenger. You're expected to play a role here. Yeah, that's a really cool way of looking at it, not just being a passenger, but getting involved. Like for me, that's always been a big part of why I build community like Evolve CPG or through design associations or food community or whatever is because whenever I'm in a place, if I want community to exist, I can just sit there and be hopeful that it'll be <laughs> become a thing or I can get involved and actually help make it happen, right? So it's that same kind of idea. Yeah. Why be a passenger and wait for someone else to do it? If you can yeah. contribute to that change, it's almost your responsibility to jump in and do it, right? For sure. Um, so what, um, what kind of advice would you give for other mission-driven kind of brands or entrepreneurs who are out there just hustling, you know, fighting the good fight, trying to bring their uh, brands to the marketplace, trying to compete, trying to fundraise. There's so many challenges of being mission driven. It, it's definitely harder to do it this yeah. way. So what advice would you give to others yeah. following in your footsteps? Well, first of all, I really would focus on that point of differentiation. Um, it, as you know, it's super competitive. Uh, and so you can't just come to market with another me too product. Um, now you could argue, well, just iced tea is very similar to honest tea <laughs> and it is, but honest tea is going away. And so they're really, without honest tea in the market, there isn't another product like it. So that's why I say it's a little bit of a gift for us to be able to go after a well-established market 
Um, but in general, you know, the mushroom jerky and the carrot jerky, those are much more unique. There really aren't products like those out there. And so you've got to make sure what you're bringing out has a reason to get on the shelf. It can't. And I, I, I wish I could say, well, taste is a, alone is enough. Taste is, is important, but just you can't just say I've got a better tasting salsa because Lord knows there's hundreds of salsa brands out there. So you've got to have a, a different approach that, that justifies you being on the shelf. Then, you know, all the other basic business uh, requirements kick in. You've got to be efficient with your cash. You've got to make, you've got to be, uh, find an amazing team and get them to be energized and inspired. I certainly believe in um, extending ownership of the enterprise to the employees as well. You know, um, you want them, I think of our, every entrepreneur, every employee in our team as an entrepreneur, and I want them to feel like they have both the empowerment to, to drive the business forward, but also the upside. So they have a stake in the company's future, meaning that if, if something good happens in the future, they benefit from that. Um, and so I think that's critical as well. I didn't realize that uh, about Eat the Change, but I, I love that. So is Eat the Change somehow like employee owned or do you just give them stock options? Like how does that work? Stock options. Yeah. Every employee okay. who's with us for more than 12 months has stock options. And if, if the past is any uh, representation of the future, you know, certainly at Honest Tea and Beyond Meat, our employees who built the business benefited greatly from, um, you know, the outcomes. That's amazing. Yeah, that's. I think so powerful because so many businesses get caught up in this system of employees are just kind of cogs in the wheel. And the only people who get the benefit when an exit happens or anything like that are the few people at the top or the, the investors, not the people yeah. who actually put the work in to build that brand and make it relevant yeah. and grow it. Right. So yeah. I think that's really beautiful. Well, and you want to, you know, as I going back to what I said earlier about it, being efficient with resources, when people feel like they're making decisions, like they're spending their own money, they make, you know, I'd say better decisions. So I mentioned we were up in New York um, for this earlier this week doing this crew drive. Well, we all shared hotel rooms. It's like, oh, that seems a little old for people in there, you know, pro mature professional people to have to share hotel rooms. But, well, look, if I were traveling with my family, I wouldn't be getting a room for everybody. And, and uh, so, you know, you just it, it, at least they can they may not love the idea of sharing hotel rooms, but they understand this is what we do to help get us to become a profitable business. That's cool. I think that also speaks to not just the being efficient with your cash, but also your willingness to, like you said before, just jump into the action and, and be part of the team rather than above the team. Like yeah. I've seen you at trade shows hustling. I see you posting pictures of yeah. you go doing store visits, like all this kind of stuff that maybe some founders, especially if this isn't your first business, might let the other team members do, right? But you're in there in the mix uh, doing absolutely. all the same work. No, you know, it's funny because like we, so even in New York, we had this, um, our head count got thrown off because someone had to, wasn't able to make it. So we had an odd number and like, oh, well, that means someone's not going to share a hotel room. And I'm like, well, it's not going to, I said, it's not going to be me. Like I, you know, like I can't be the one, I can't ask other people to make these sacrifices if I'm not doing that myself. Yeah. So that's almost another piece of advice maybe that you would give is, you know, be willing to make the sacrifices and do the hard work and whatever. Like you're never, yeah. you're never too big to, to do any role in the company, right? You yeah. got to be knee deep in it. And that's another thing that's super important. And I see a lot of times get mistaken, which is never forget how the business grows, right? So, you know, you cannot be an armchair or a desk chair, um, entrepreneur for a natural foods business. You've got to be connected to what's happening in the trade. And so it's funny, we, we, um, I'm literally in a store every day. Now, sometimes it just means there's, there's a giant supermarket across the street from our office. So maybe it's just too easy, but <laughs> I'm, I always walk through the store and I'll always spot something that I either learn or a little insight or just sort of understand a transformation that's happening. Um, and so you just, you got to stay connected to what's happening and, and, you know, you can look at your numbers, all our spreadsheets all day, but that's, that's one way to look at the business. Um, but if you lose sight of what really drives a business, that's, that's a bad, bad sign. So that, that's really interesting. What, what kind of, what's an example of something that maybe you spot while being in a store every day oh. that like has helped your business? Yeah. So I, I did a, I visited a bunch of stores yesterday. Uh, I was at a natural food store up in Olney, Maryland. And first of all, I was struck by how much, and this is, it's not a vegan store. Uh, it's just a, it's a natural food store. 
I saw tons of plant-based offerings in new categories that I hadn't seen. I saw plant-based ravioli, meaning not just the noodles, but the filling on the inside, um, like butternut squash and, and like another spinach and cheese, but all plant-based. Um, I saw take-home chicken pot pies that were vegan. Uh, I hadn't seen yeah. that before. And so it just helped me understand that um, these stores are now making everyday offerings, and they're not just for vegan people. These were yeah. uh, merchandise right alongside the animal-based pot pies. Uh, but it was like, wow, okay, that's, that was just interesting to see that. And then, of course, you know, I, I saw a beautiful display of just iced tea. <laughs> nice. uh, and it was also interesting to see there were some bottles of honest tea next to it. And so, you know, I'm getting a, basically a daily read on honest tea inventory levels and just <laughs> iced tea. And of course, we're in this moment of transition where they're both on the shelf. But, you know, probably by the end of the year, you'll, you won't be seeing honest tea just because Coke's, you know, running down their inventory. Um, and so it's all real time. I don't have to sort of ask anybody, oh, what's going on? Is honest tea still available on the market? Like today, um, we saw this, somebody sent in a picture in one of the Whole Foods, there was a, uh, a shelf, an entire 12 foot section of honest tea, but it was all the same variety, which tells me, okay, they've run out of inventory on <laughs> other varieties. And this is sort of the one they overproduced and, and they'll run that down. But so you just learn all types of little things about competition, uh, your own product. So then the other thing you'll see I, um, during my New York crew drive, I literally went into dozens of stores and I got to see where Just Ice Tea was sold. I got to see which were the best sellers, right? So keep in mind, we just launched Just Ice Tea. We, and when someone says, what's your top seller? I'm like, I don't know because I haven't, there's no sell-through data yet. But this uh. was my first anecdotal data and, and some of the early insights is that our half and half tea seems to be doing extremely well. Um, you know, and, and so I didn't see that. When the product was sold out, it was often our half and half half tea, half lemonade that was selling out more quickly. So you just, you know, you can gain all types of insights uh, in a store. And then, you know, the other thing I'm always looking at, what are new product categories emerging? What are some products that don't seem to be moving? Um, what are some new packages out there that, you know, how are people thinking about different formats? So, um, you know, a grocery store or any store is, is a live laboratory for consumer research if you look at it through that lens. Yeah, I love that. And I'm not sure how long the delay is, but so many people just wait for like spins data or or consumer insights reports or whatever to come out. But by the time those come out, you're a year or two behind the game, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Spins data, any of that data is historical. It's not future oriented. Yeah. Um, so you've got to make sure, you know, we do obviously pay attention to those trends, but, you know, being in the trade gives you a sense of what's happening now and where you, where things might be headed. Yeah, so speaking of that, with your kind of experience doing these store visits and just being kind of in the field and seeing what's going on, are you seeing strong differences depending on region? For example, if you're in a store in the Northeast and you're seeing one product uh, that's kind of selling through faster, if you flew out to the West Coast, would a different product be selling faster? Or, you, or do you find that it's like kind of common across the country? Um, so with the tea, it's still too early. I mean, historically, uh, bottled tea is a more of a Northeast drink. You know, we sold, uh, for honest tea, we sold more honest tea in New York City than we did in the entire state of California. Oh, um, wow. So, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, so, but, but that said, there'll be varieties, you know, cer certainly um, green teas sell better out West, whereas like a black tea is more popular in the Northeast. And that's probably some cultural, you know, traditions associated with that. Uh, in terms of the other snacks, like the carrots, um, it's funny, we, we have seen our, so in the East, our, our um, sour cherry berry uh, is our top seller for the kids line, but the, the mango is more popular out West. So yeah, there's some flavor differences. Oh, that's um, cool. And, you know, I, I, I don't even know how to, where, what the explanation is, but there are di regional differences for sure. I mean, I guess based on what you were just talking about, both of those make sense because, you know, maybe green tea comes in more from... Asia hits the West Coast and then kind of filters through out to the East Coast. So like more of the Asian food influence yeah. is going to be stronger there, whereas in the East is going to be more of like yeah. Britain and Europe's influence. Yeah. It could also just be the health. You know, green tea certainly has more of a health perception. You have right, more of a right. healthy food culture um, sort of in the West into Colorado. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so 
you know, you've been in the business for a while. You've been part of some really influential brands and companies. And now you're, you know, diving in with more and more uh, products. So since you have such a good understanding of the market and you're tapping in day to day in store tours and everything, what would you say the future of food looks like? Mm. Well, here's an interesting, this is one thing I've been learning just over the past few months that kind of surprised me because I had assumed, you know, so much of the internet, you know, internet was going to play a much larger role, e-commerce and we have a snack company. And so finally I'm like, oh, I don't have to worry about shipping bottles through, you know, for, over, you know, e-commerce or, <laughs> yeah. or we'd be on me, you know, having to worry about ice packs. Um, and, but I've, uh, we've just dipped a toe in the water on e-commerce. We're on, you know, we do our own Shopify site and we're on Amazon, but um, I've talked to enough other um, colleagues in the snack world um, and it feels like no one's really making um, profitable business through e-commerce. And so, um, you know, because if we were talking maybe two years ago, someone said, oh, you know, 90% or 50% of sales is going to happen through e-commerce. Yeah. I'm not convinced that's the case. Um, and so I actually um, do see actually a little bit of a resurgence for brick and mortar now. Like people are still, now they could still be buying it through um, Instacart or, you know, um, have their food delivered. But I, I actually think Brick and mortar grocery is still going to play an important role in shaping our diets and shaping what happens. The other thing that I, and I'll take, this is just one of my takeaways from our crew drive in New York this week that really surprised me. In food service, the, the buyers have much more influence these days. So we were going and meeting with a lot of office cafeterias. And what they, I consistently heard is these office cafeterias do not want plastic bottles. Uh, and of course, uh, because just I see in a glass bottle, it was good news for me, but I was really struck. So these are, you know, like the client may be a bank, you know, and they just say, we want only glass bottles or only metal cans for our drink offerings. Um, and so even though plastic is cheaper uh, for the companies, I think there is going to be continue to be a move away from plastic containers. Uh, and so that's interesting. You know, you'll, you'll hear yeah. environmentalists or you'll hear, hear a debate about the environmental merits of glass versus plastic versus uh, aluminum. But from the shopper perception, from the consumer perception, plastic is, is actually in a challenged uh, area right now. And, and I'm, you know, I'm thankful that's not something we anticipate going into as a package. Yeah, I know that with Just Ice Tea, you made the decision to go into glass again, right? So that makes sense. Right. But what I... Right wasn't aware of like i know that's the right decision from a sustainability even though it is heavier more fragile whatever it's just more infinitely recyclable better for the environment etc but i didn't think that food service or, or corporate offices would would be thinking about that as well do you think for them were they saying it's because their employees or their customers are de demanding no plastic like you're saying yeah. or is it like part of their yeah. corporate sustainability stuff to try to reduce their own absolutely waste what, okay yeah, that was what we kept hearing from the, the food service managers. Sustainability, sustainability is really important. And so, you know, what happens, you'll get a big company, you know, maybe even, like I said, it could have a bank or someone who has this commitment to being, you know, planet carbon neutral or uh, by 2025 or something. And so they're looking at everything. And as part of that, um, it's a move away from plastic. And to me, um, like I said, we, I could debate either side of the package thing, but from from my perspective, that's a wonderful change because what eat the change itself, the phrase eat the change, it's a call to action. It's a call to accountability and a call to empowerment. It means that everything we, every um, consumption decision we make has an impact. And so what it means is these customers are thinking about the impact of their choices. And to me, that's a very encouraging trend. Yeah, I love that. It's a... Uh... It's been a long time coming, right? A lot of brands like like your own Honesty <laughs> or others have been working at this for decades. Yeah. So, and it obviously yeah. in the super green category, there's been demand there, but it's nice to see that the demand is expanding further and further into the mainstream. So that's really encouraging. Uh, yeah. Another trend you've been pretty involved with, maybe your entire career. I'm not sure if you've ever done any actual animal based products, but like plant based. So it's we've been hearing a lot about plant-based being one of the fastest growing trends during the pandemic. And then there's also been talk of like some of the plant-based options out there. 
um, are starting to to sink a little bit in sales growth, but others are still continuing to grow pretty fast. But what what do you feel like is the future for plant based foods? Yeah, well, as you know, there are some ups and downs. But when you look at it in a much longer lens, not longer, even a ten year lens. In ten years ago, Beyond Meat was doing less than a million dollars in sales. This year, it'll do over four hundred million dollars in sales. So. Um, I'd sign up for that kind of opportunity any day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I think that this category, you'll, you know, six years ago, um, the Beyond Burger just was launched. And so now you look at every major grocery store now has plant-based offerings in the meat section of the store. Yeah. So yeah. we've created a whole new category. And uh, the goal is not to make everybody vegan. Um, the goal is to get everyone to have a few more plant-based meals per week. And I feel like that's happening. I feel like restaurant chains are also moving in that direction. Major restaurant chains are making sure to include a plant-based offering, not as sort of in the, you know, in the footnote at the end of the menu, but like in the center of the menu. Right. And that also <laughs> speaks uh, well for the future. So um, you look at a category like plant-based dairy today represents 16% of the dairy category and animal-based dairy continues to decline. So to me, those are encouraging trends and, and, by far, uh, plant-based dairy is the most developed of these categories. But I think whether it's plant-based meat, plant-based cheese, plant-based egg, they're all going to continue to grow. Um, so I, 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 whether it's for environmental reasons or nutritional reasons uh, or in, um, just humane reasons, uh, I think all of, all, sort of all of the above will continue to drive interest in plant-based options. Wonderful. Uh, so I know Eat the Change is probably a little bit further distributed right now than uh, Just Ice Tea since Just Ice Tea is just hitting shelves. But where can people find your products right now? Yeah. So um, the Just Ice Tea is launched in Sprouts nationally. It'll be in Whole Foods nationally in about a week or two. Our uh, mushroom snacks are in the Whole Foods stores in um, the Mid Whole Foods Mid-Atlantic and Whole Foods NorCal. Our um, carrot snacks are available in Sprouts nationally, and they'll be expanding into Whole Foods uh, over the course of the, uh, next month. So we'll see them there. Uh, and then lots of the one, all the wonderful independent natural retailers, um, whether it's Mom's Organic Market or Air One or PCC, just around the country. Any good natural retailer, uh, I would hope, is carrying some a part of our product line. And of course, over the next year, we look to see it, those expand. Uh, the other, another nice chain that's been a great partner is High V in the Midwest. Okay, they carry both uh, just iced tea and the, the uh, carrot juice. Nice. Okay, so people can find it there if they can't find it in a local store. It sounded like you also sell through e-commerce. Yes, and I should also mention Giant Giant Food here in Maryland carries both. The mushrooms, uh, the carrot snacks, and they'll be carrying the tea uh, by next week. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I appreciate you carving out some time in your busy schedule out there hustling, visiting all the stores uh, <laughs> to share your story with us. And as per our conversations on LinkedIn, what I also really appreciate is that um, mission-driven entrepreneurs like you aren't going to just let that mission dissolve um, when you know Big mm -hmm. Food or anyone else kind of uh, cuts it like you'll you'll do the work you'll relaunch the brand you'll get back on the streets you'll go out there and hustle to make sure that people have better food options so i really appreciate that well thank you for saying that and you know um if anyone had doubts about you know if, if anyone thought that you know i was in it just for the money i would have stopped <laughs> when honest tea was sold you know and, and of course i didn't i stayed through basically eight years after coke bought the business i was still connected to it and then once coca-cola said they were getting rid of honest tea. And then I'm like, well, then there's the need is still there. And of course the opportunity as well. So, uh, this is not, this is not a, um, this was not a one and done, uh, undertaking. Yeah. I think that's definitely apparent. So, uh, thanks for being who you are and kind of staying involved, uh, not being a passenger on the side or, uh, or on the sidelines you're in it to win it. Right. So I <laughs> appreciate that. Thank you, Gage. All right. Good Thank chat. You. Thanks. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Seth, Eat the Change, or Just Ice Tea, visit eatthechange.com. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more innovator interviews, expert advice, and leadership discussions. If you like this episode, leave a heart, thumbs up, or review, and share it with your colleagues. As an ever-evolving show, we also love feedback, so send us your thoughts or ideas for who we should talk to next to evolve 
at modernspecies.com.